Welcome to Masters and Creators from Frames to Names, the show where we look at some of the most influential creators in history and how their influence impacts the way that we tell stories to this day. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the master of comics himself, Jack the King Kirby. <laughs> Think of a character you believe Stan Lee created, any character at all. Well, chances are Jack Kirby actually made that character. But before we get into all of that, you need to know a basic knowledge of comic book history because believe it or not, Jack Kirby is comic book history. So from 1938 to 1950, you have what's known as the golden age of comics. Characters like Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Captain America, and the Human Torch came into people's lives for the first time. It was the birth of the superhero genre itself. But after World War II, people weren't really feeling superheroes anymore. Like those types of comics just were not selling at all. The most popular genres at this time period were cowboy western, romance, and horror comics. I do just want to stress that in this time period, if you said comic book, people didn't instantly think of superheroes. People just thought of it as a way of telling stories. Also, the word graphic novel didn't even exist yet because that word actually came out of snobbery of something being called a comic book, but it making it onto the New York Times bestseller list. So they couldn't have comics on that list. So it had to be a graphic novel. Naturally, all good things come to an end and this era met its end at the hands of a man called Frederick Retham. He created a book stating that all of these crime, horror, romance, you name it, comic books, were going to corrupt America's youth and turn them all into delinquents. And people like believed him. So nationwide, mothers would gather all of their children's comic books, dating right back to the beginning of the golden age of comics, go to the ends of their street and just burn them. Following this, the Comics Code Authority was put together and the Comics Code Authority was basically this non-legally binding guidebook on what comic writers and artists could and couldn't say and could and couldn't draw. It made the most popular genres impossible to write. Horror basically died for a long time in comic books. Publishers just had to go back to doing superhero comics, but even then they weren't as in-depth as they used to be. They were very much black and white, good versus evil, and it was always very obvious that good guys were going to win. And then in 1961, Stan Lee takes the remains of Atlas Comics, because Atlas had been struggling for a while at this point, and Jack Kirby was already working there, and together they revolutionized the industry. Jack Kirby creates characters such as the Fantastic Four, Ant-Man, the Wasp, Black Panther, and so many others. And this was how Jack Kirby was involved with the creation of Marvel Comics. Stan Lee was on the business front, and I do just want to say the Stan Lee Jack Kirby situation is very complicated and it has like its own history like it'll take about half an hour to explain on its own so i will say this for much of his life jack kirby tried suing stan lee and he died before this case could meet its end but it continued post his death his family saw it through to the end and in the end the judge did decide in his favor with this being said without stan lee we would not have the marvel that we know and love today just because he didn't make a lot of these characters that he took credit for doesn't mean he didn't do anything he is a business genius and chances are he did have some form of involvement with the creation of these characters but i'm not here to spend my time on this topic i'm here to highlight why jack kirby should be a household name just as much as Stanley. So Jack Kirby was born in 1917 and was the son of Austrian Jewish immigrants. He grew up in Manhattan's Lower East Side. And because of this, he knew New York like the back of his hand. And that's why so many of Marvel comics are set in New York because that's what Jack Kirby knew. To escape this grim and violent world around him, he found himself lost in comic books, specifically creating them and drawing them. And he was a really creative kid. And he was completely self-taught. The only time he had a formal education was when he enrolled himself in the Pratt Institute for like a week and then just dropped out because he was like, they want people that want to work on a single project forever. And I just want to get stuff Done. By 1939, he had started working professionally and he had worked on both Popeye and Betty Boop. Then in 1940, he began working on the Blue Beetle for Fox Feature Syndicate because the Blue Beetle is not actually a DC character, DC just bought him. It's here that he would meet Joe Simon and the two would have an amazing partnership together that lasted basically a decade. And the two would go on to work at Timely Comics and create Captain America. The first issue sold out as quick as it was released. And then the second issue sold over a million 
copies, which was unheard of in this time. The two of them were getting $75 a week at this time, which was a lot for the time period, but considering their comics were selling over a million issues every time they were being released, that wasn't nearly enough. So Simon had the idea for the two of them to go over to National Comics, which would later become DC Comics. So while he was negotiating all of this, the two kept this plan very much a secret. But then someone at Timely Comics found out, reported it to Timely's editor-in-chief, and the two of them lost their job as of Captain America number 10. And while not all was bad, he would marry his wife Roz in 1942. By 1943, he had to leave for the war. Kirby was given position of scout, which basically meant he would have to go into enemy territory, create maps of their towns, and then get out without being killed. By the time he returned from the war, superhero comics were out, so he found a lot of success in romance comics, still working with Simon. But by the time the mid-1950s came about and the Comics Code Authority was in full force, Simon basically left comics and Kirby just started working as a freelancer. Around this time, he was doing 75 pages a month. To put that into context, most comic artists throughout history have only ever done 22 pages a month. He would have some highlights during this time period, like his run on Green Arrow for DC Comics. And in fact, he didn't want Green Arrow to be a Batman clone, so he had the character doing sort of like sci-fi adventures, which the creator of Green Arrow was not happy about. It wasn't until the editor-in-chief of Atlas Comics, Stan Lee, wanted to totally rebrand Atlas and make it into Marvel Comics that things changed for Kirby. It's here that he would take his knowledge of the streets of New York and his love of science fiction and create a number of revolutionary characters. You had the Fantastic Four, the Hulk, Iron Man, Thor, the Avengers, Black Panther, and most importantly, in my opinion, the X-Men. The X-Men in particular were revolutionary because you see, up to this point, very few characters had been born with their powers. I think Superman was one of the few exceptions, but even then he was an alien. There were very few humans that were just born with powers. So Kirby created this superhero team, but they were born with their powers, but they were discriminated against because of it. And they were all led by Professor Xavier. Also, during this time period, his artwork totally transformed the comic book landscape. You see, up to this point, comics were very, like, stiff, sort of like people posing like robots. And he just didn't like this, so he decided to not do that. He added power and fluidity into the character's movements, and now that's the standard across the board. However, Kirby eventually became very frustrated at Stan Lee. You see, Stan Lee was taking a little bit too much credit for Kirby's work. He was doing all of these media appearances, and Kirby was given, like, no media appearances. And in 1970, he was given a total bogus contract, which would have basically stripped him of all of his creator's rights. So he just walked away from Marvel and went over to their direct rights. Rival, DC. It is worth stressing, Stan Lee has stated that he's made many mistakes in this time period, and this was one of them. At DC, he would create something called the Fourth World, which is like so influential it never gets credited as an influence. Like, if you're a Star Wars fan, read Jack Kirby's Fourth World. If you're a Mocross Frontier fan, read Jack Kirby's Fourth World. If you're a Gundam fan, read Jack Kirby's Fourth World. Like anything in that space opera umbrella, just read the fourth world. Trust me, you'll thank me later. However, he quickly discovered that DC was just as bad as Marvel when it came to how they treated their creators, so he went back on over to Marvel because that was a field that he knew really well. The issue Kirby had did partially come down to money. You see, back then it was normal for creators to just get like a one-time fee or a weekly salary and that would be it. So if a character blew up, like Captain America, you wouldn't see any more money beyond your initial payment, but that meant when the character is in shops and in movies and on t-shirts and there are toys, that creator should surely get some money for that because that creator designed the character. But that wasn't the case back then. It's actually all because of Kirby's struggles with creator's rights throughout his entire life and Alan Moore's struggles with creator's rights throughout his entire life that comic creators are finally given a proper cut and are treated properly. These days, there are even comic publishers like Image where comics are totally creator-owned. Like, Image just publishes them and puts them out there for people, but people can make their own decisions in regards to their own comics, which is great to see. DC even have their own creator-owned imprint called Vertigo. However, at this point, his career begins to wind down, which was fair enough. He was 62 when all of this came around, so it's 
fair enough that he might want to take things a little bit slowly. He would create a few more characters for Marvel, including Devil Dinosaur, which is one of my favourite Marvel characters actually that I never get to talk about, and he would even have a brief stint in animation where he would work on a Fantastic Four cartoon with Stan Lee. The last comic Kirby would ever create was Phantom Force for Image Comics, and in 1994 he would pass away with his wife following him shortly after. Normally I would sum up what this creator did in this end paragraph, but you can't do that with Jack Kirby because his influence touches every corner of media. It's insane. This guy is never credited, but he's so influential beyond what anyone else has ever done with the medium of comic books. Kirby's influence has stopped the medium of comics from dying out time and time again, be it from creator's rights to just coming up with good stories. When other people are stuck, they turn back to Kirby. One writer in particular I know is partially influenced by Kirby is Grant Morrison, the master of mysticism in media. And that's who we're going to be talking about next week on Masters and Creators from Frames to Names.